A warm and graceful evening to one and all. It is my privilege to welcome all the participating veterinarians, though it may be a student, faculty, researcher, scientist from India and abroad. It is also my honor and privilege to welcome today's guest of speaker, guest speaker, Honorable Professor Dr. Colonel A.K. Gallows, sir, and Mr. P. Karunanidhi, Senior Vice President, LMB Pharmaceutical Limited. Uh, for the information of all the participants and for the information of the speaker, LMB Pharmaceutical Limited from 1st of 1st January 2021 to 31st January, 31st December 2021, conducted 60 webinars for the field veterinarian, faculty, and researcher. Out of that, 10 webinars belong to Alembic CBE. The rest of the 50 webinars with the association with the renowned university societies and the association. Apart from that, more than 30 uh, farmer tra training program, Alembic ph Pharmaceutical was a knowledge partner. Though it did dairy farmer, poultry farmer, shepherd, pig, piggery, and pet parenting. And all this is possible because it is because of possible because of our guidance of Mr. P. Corona, the senior vice president, Olympic Pharmaceutical Limited. He is a motivational force for us to conduct the same. And our objective for the next financial year is that the 2021 we will cross 100 webinar. And our objective of continue, uh, giving continuous veterinary education to the field veterinarian will be achieved. Now I will I will invite. Mr. P. Kronanidhi, sir, who is a person behind this webinar series and motivational force behind us to introduce our today's guest speaker. Welcome all veterinarians and uh, good afternoon to each and every one. And it is my pleasure and privilege in introducing such an eminent speaker like Dr. Professor Dr. Colonel A.K. Gallant. So, A.K. Gallard, sir, is a member of Governor Advisory Board Rajasthan. Currently, he's a task force of higher education and uh, Bombay, the founder and former vice chancellor of Rajuvas, Bikaner. So, Professor Dr. Colonel A.K. Gallard is a BVSC AH gold medalist during his uh, UG studies and MUSC first position, and he also completed his PhD way back during his studies. He is a fellow of various forums like you know, NAVS, ISVM, IAAR, VR, ISACP, SIAP. So I think the various forums you know, take this opportunity to gain a lot of knowledge from uh, Dr. A.K. Gallard. So that's why he has been invi invited by many of these uh, forums. Professor Dr. Colonel A.K. Gallard, sir, is a charismatic leader who has towering personality, has given valuable guideline to thousands of students during his academic career and research career, India as well as in abroad. He has become a professor of veterinary medicine in 1996. His leadership skills and his ability to handle multiple tasks simultaneously has led him to become a Dean of College of Veterinary and Animal Science Bikaner in 2000. And simultaneously, he became the founder, Vice Chancellor of Rajasthan University of Veterinary Science and Animal Science, Raju Vas. Previously, I think it was associated with the Agriculture University. So it was separated and it has become a separate veterinary university in May 18, 2010. So he was a founder member, our founding vice chancellor. He holds numerous awards, accolades in his professional journey. Some of them, you know, worth mentioning here, though I cannot mention each and everything because the list is so long. The honorary rank of colonel commandant was bestowed upon by uh, Professor Dr. A.K. Gallard by Government of India on 3rd June 2011. And he was awarded IAAVR Fellowship on 11th February 2011 for his outstanding research contributions in the field of veterinary and animal sciences. As a Vice Chancellor of Rajuvas, Bikaner, 
He was also awarded by former President of India, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. And formerly, Dr. Colonel A.K. Galat sir was involved in RAC, I think Rajasthan Agriculture College of ICAR and CAR Mirat UGC team for accreditation of ICAR and IVRI, Izzat Nagar, ICAR peer review team for Sri Venkateshwara Veterinary University, Tripadi for accreditation, and also ICAR peer review team for P.V. Narsim Rao uh, Veterinary University, Hyderabad. So he's a member, earlier he was a member in Rajasthan Farmers Commission, EC, our executive member in IAUA, VCI, RSVC, I think Rajasthan State Veterinary Council, uh, ICR Review Committee for AICRP, and University Council of Jammu and Kashmir. And not only that, that was previous membership and uh, various forums he was leading. After his retirement also, currently he is involved in, involved in various prestigious assignments as a member in Rajasthan Governor's Advisory Board, Task Force on Higher Education of Rajasthan Governor Secretariat, State Editorial Board of District Gazettees of Rajasthan, Board of Management of Rajuas Bikaner, Board of Management of Police University Jodhpur, Executive Council, Chhattisgarh, Krishi Vidya, Raipur, Academic Council of SKRAU, Bikaner. So, as a member, he is participating in many of these uh, institutes. And also, he is chairman in various uh, institutes currently. And he is actively involved in uh, formulating government policies as an advisor and also as an uh, academic member in various universities. So that speaks, you know, how important, how actively uh, Dr. Uh, A.K. Galat Sar is involved after his retirement also in the academic activities or the research activities. So currently he's a vice president in Indian Veterinary Association, national convener of Rajasthan, Go Seva Parishad, and Go Samvardhan Mahamantri of Rajasthan, Go Seva Samiti, Jaipur. So I think it's a great pleasure on behalf of Alambik also for the participant, you know, who is going to listen to his uh, uh, lecture. It's a great welcome and it's a great honor on behalf of Alambik. Thank you very much, sir. Over to Dr. A.K. Galat, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. P. Karnanidhi, Senior Vice President of Alambik, and it's really a pleasure. And uh, I am, uh, you know, I was, uh, it was a pleasant astonishment to me that uh, you collected so many photographs <laughs> of my activities. So, uh, thank you so much, Team Alembic. And uh, it's a really proud privilege for me to uh, be here uh, amongst the veterinary fraternity of the country. I have been told that uh, for this uh, webinar, more than 1,600 professionals, they have already got registered. Uh, so, uh, for me, you know, uh, uh, the topic, although I was... Uh, one of, uh, I was the chooser of the topic, but then uh, when I started working over it, I found that you know it's a really tough topic and uh, it uh, enters into uh, physiology, biochemistry, and so many other uh, you know branches of veterinary uh, veterinary sciences. And uh, uh, it's a pleasant surprise for me that many of the teachers and professors they have also registered and they are. Uh, presently uh, uh, present here. So uh, uh, thanks and kudos to Alembic uh, for organizing, uh, continuously organizing uh, such ECVEs. And I think this is only organization which is at present and during COVID period, uh, non-stop had conducted as uh, has been mentioned by Dr. Santosh Shinde also that during last uh, 
year 2021, uh, more than 60 such CVs were, uh, and a very tough target has been set up by yourself. Uh, 100 CV, uh, that means every third, fourth day, there will be one ECV, and this is really a human service. And uh, I would uh, advise and request all the uh, practicing veterinarians and uh, young uh, scientists and teachers to, to uh, uh, who should make it a point that they should not miss because this is a single platform where uh, you can uh, take uh, the information uh, in almost all directions in uh, uh, from uh, you know experts of the field as well as uh, uh, in a very short span and uh, i am happy that uh, dr shinde and his team uh, must have uh, you know must have become experts in so many areas because they are all uh, uh, all the time they are present and uh, uh, listening very keenly to the presentations of the experts so uh, I have tried to make uh, this very vast topic uh, uh, easy as well as uh, short. And the only aim is that, you know, uh, at the end of this today's ECVE, I should be able to instill, uh, you know, confidence into the practicing veterinarians uh, to, uh, you know, wisefully use uh, fluid therapy in uh, animals. So uh, with these remarks, uh, uh, and I will request all the participants to fasten their uh, seat belts to uh, go through along with me and the journey of, you know, uh, understanding uh, the principles of uh, fluid therapy in uh, veterinary and animal sciences. So again, once again, I am thankful on behalf of all the participants to uh, LMB to have organized and to have given me this uh, pleasant opportunity to become a teacher once again uh, after so many years of you know living teaching. So it's my proud privilege and uh, really a pleasure. So uh, in this presentation, we shall try to find answers to some important questions with respect to fluid therapy. Uh, you know. Uh, these, these are the, some of the common questions that what are the principles of fluid therapy? Why to give at all fluid therapy? And then why to give, then what to give? Because we know that there is a big ambit of uh, fluid therapy, uh, you know, uh, drugs available with us. And then how much to uh, give? So these are the, some of the basic questions which come in the mind of a uh, practitioner once he or she decides uh, to administer uh, fluid therapy. So before going further, let us first understand. Now in this picture, you are uh, you know uh, seeing a drop of water falling on a uh, you know floor, and how it is uh, distributing itself uh, on the surface. So uh, let us first understand how water is distributed in the body as fluids. So uh, if we uh, look into uh, the body water, uh, we usually describe that there are two uh, important compartments of the uh, water or fluid in the body. One is known as intracellular fluid, uh, ICF we usually abbreviate it, uh, which uh, is existing within the cell itself and then outside the cells, extracellular fluid. So uh, if we see that the intracellular fluid, the total volume is around two third of the uh, total water or fluid present in the body. And rest one third is occupying the spaces as extracellular fluid in the interstitial space, as well as the blood vessels. So that means, uh, you know, uh, 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 we are administering every time uh, fluid therapy, uh, uh, intravenously, uh, most of the time, although there are uh, subcutaneous routes also available and uh, some other uh, very you know, unorthodox routes are there, but mainly uh, we consider that it is the IV intravenous fluid therapy. So the fluid uh, to which we are approaching directly is the blood vessel and then uh, interstitial space. So what is the you know uh, volume of uh, 
fluid in the uh, uh, blood. So if we see 75% of the uh, fluid is the interstitial fluid, or we call it IC, ISF, and then 75% or 25% is the uh, fluid present in the blood vessels. That means 25% of total one-third extracellular fluid. And it amounts to roughly around 8%. Uh, so, so that is the you know uh, 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 volume which is uh, uh, present as blood. There is some variation, so th uh, that's why I have preferred this table to be presented. In some of the animals, uh, like uh, cat, it is around 5.5 percent. So basically, it ranges from 5.5 to roughly around 8.6 percent. So uh, you know, uh, around 8% or little less than 8% fluid is uh, there uh, or the blood is there as a blood volume of the body weight of uh, an animal. So this, this figure will always be a guiding figure for us that how much fluid we are uh, trying to enter into the uh, uh, blood vascular system or intravenously. Now, as we know, the most important uses of fluid, uh, uh, first we need to know how to prevent or minimize the use of fluids as a therapy. So first point, we all know that we should maintain the hydration of the animal and then continuous supply of salt and minerals so that the electrolyte balance is uh, maintained. Uh, but then, uh, how to treat in animals with disease in which losses are occurring. Now, uh, uh, we are uh, administering fluid therapy in order to reduce the degree of dehydration, acid-base imbalance or electrolyte uh, imbalance or hypovolemia. These three are the major you know, conditions which attract uh, demand for uh, immediate uh, fluid therapy. Uh, in uh, animals. Now, major therapeutic objectives of fluid therapy, uh, then we can very well say that uh, correct the abnormalities. Now, this correction of abnormalities is uh, very soon, as soon as possible, and usually we uh, take a window of four to six hours, that during four to six hours, we should uh, be able to correct the, you know, uh, abnormalities, what are uh, there in the form of dehydration or electrolyte imbalance or hypovolemia. And then uh, we need to provide a maintenance therapy also, maybe from uh, for next two to four days uh, to uh, maintain. And uh, we know that there are at least five possible abnormalities that could exist at the same time and must be corrected. Now, what are these five? Uh, you know, abnormalities, fluid volume deficit, uh, or we can call it uh, dehydration. Then uh, plasma osmolar deficits, that means osmolarity of uh, plasma is reduced. Uh, or there may be specific electrolyte imbalances also, uh, where uh, some of the electrolytes, uh, they are uh, lost. And then acid-base imbalance, acidemia or alkalinemia may be there. Then oncotic pressure imbalances. Now, what is this oncotic pressure? We'll see uh, because this seems to be a you know a term. But then, many a times, the sixth uh, uh, possible uh, cause may also be there to use intravenous uh, fluid therapy as a vehicle of other drugs, or uh, many a times uh, our practicing veterinarians, they understand it very well that uh, we may be required to uh, give fluid therapy as a placebo also. So these are the, uh, uh, the possible abnormalities uh, where we uh, um, need to require uh, fluid therapy. Now, before going into details, that uh, which fluid we should uh, prefer. Let us understand osmolarity. Osmolarity is defined as proportion of dissolved particles uh, in an amount of fluid and is generally the term used to describe body fluids. 
uh, as the dissolved particles become more concentrated, the osmolarity increases. So there is a particular, uh, you know, standard osmolarity or normal osmolarity of the plasma uh, presence of, you know, uh, uh, the soluble as well as maybe insoluble particles and and that uh, uh, decides the osmolarity and that we need to keep in mind the fluid which we are uh, injecting in the form of fluid therapy uh, how or does it match to the osmolarity whether it is uh, subosmolar or hyperosmolar that we will see later on and osmolality it refers to the proportion of dissolved particles in a specific weight of fluid so these terms you know, uh, our uh, osmolality is uh, uh, in in the in uh, in context of the weight, and osmolarity is in context of the uh, volume. And often these terms uh, are used in interchangeably in clinical practice. So, uh, so uh, we we can use uh, any uh, you know uh, term. Now, coming back to the oncotic pressure, which was there. Now, this is a specific pressure, which is, uh, uh, it's a type of osmotic pressure, which is generated by large molecules, especially proteins, uh, which are present in the uh, plasma, as we all know, in almost all body fluids, uh, proteins are always present. And we know that the osmotic pressure, which is generated uh, by, by uh, soluble, uh, you know, uh, uh, chemicals like sodium chloride, uh, it it follows a, uh, a law which is known as Van't Hoff's law, where the concentration as we increase the concentration, the uh, the the osmotic pressure increases uh, in the uh, in, uh, and follows a you know straight line uh, curve. They are directly proportionate. But as far as oncotic pressure is concerned, uh, because of the presence of uh, large molecules, especially the proteins. Uh, the the uh, Van't Hoff's law is not followed uh, uh, particularly, and uh, it is more followed by smaller uh, globular proteins and less followed by uh, larger proteins. So, if the molecule protein uh, molecule is large enough, you know the oncotic pressure will surge uh, uh, beyond the uh, Van't Hoff's curve, and the plasma oncotic pressure. Uh, or uh, which we uh, we can call it a uh, as a vascular fluid retention force also uh, it is uh, measured as uh, colloid oncotic pressure or cop because of the fact that the uh, proteins they they form a colloid uh, uh, there is one other term crystalloid which we will see uh, in the later uh, slides in normal animals it is uh, 20 to 25 milli millimeter of mercury. This is the uh, you know, uh, pressure. And quantitatively approximated from albumin values, means albumin uh, remains two to four gram per deciliter of uh, uh, plasma, uh, which uh, is directly proportionate to the uh, colloid oncotic pressure uh, if we measure in the uh, um, uh, vascular fluid. So that means, can we measure it and uh, the, the COP or colloid osmotic pressure uh, is reflected directly uh, with the quantity of albumin present in the uh, plasma. So uh, uh, my answer is yes, because of the fact that, you know, uh, if we see that uh, there is uh, uh, in some of the animals, we find that uh, they develop edema uh, um, and edema reason is hypoproteinemia so uh, we administer uh, soluble proteins uh, intravenously so to increase the cop or colloid osmotic uh, pressure and uh, to prevent the leakage of extra fluid to uh, the uh, extra vascular spaces or intercellular spaces so uh, one uh, you know uh, uh, cost effective way to augment uh, colloid osmotic pressure is administration of dextran 70 
no this is a you know uh, a, a larger uh, you know uh, polysaccharide uh, molecule uh, at the dose rate of 10 to 20 ml per kg uh, body weight or uh, or continuous infusion of 1 to 2 ml per kg per hour so these may be the rates of uh, administering dextran uh, 70 to correct the uh, colloid osmotic pressure and uh, blood or plasma transfusion they are another alternatives to uh, for correcting uh, hypovolemic shock which are not uh, discussed in this presentation we are not discussing it because of the fact that they come under the uh, uh, you know transfusion uh, therapies so uh, that's entirely a, 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 a very big topic uh, to be discussed so now uh, let us see what is the osmotic pressure and tonicity now if we uh, um, see that the osmotic pressure is exerted by crystalloid solutions means the solutions like sodium chloride uh, maybe we even uh, the dextrose also all soluble uh, you know ingredients of uh, fluid therapy they exert a uh, uh, osmotic pressure and uh, uh, we call isotonic crystalloid solution uh, where the concentration of the crystalloid substances in the plasma as well as in the fluid are almost the same uh, we call hypertonic crystalloid solution where the concentration of these crystalloid uh, molecules they are more in the in the fluid which we are administering than what they are present in the plasma and the hypotonic crystalloid solution is that uh, where the concentration of these uh, you know crystalloid molecules is less than the uh, what is there in uh, plasma so that's how we we classify any solution as isotonic, hypertonic, or uh, hypotonic. Now, uh, no, uh, uh, this is a one just pictorial, very easy to understand, uh, you know, uh, slight demonstration that there is a, a you know, arbitrary picture of a, uh, an RBC. So, solute or the crystalloid solutions, the, uh, the so molecules of the um, uh, solute and then water molecules are there so so if if their concentration is more uh, within the cell then we call it a, uh, the the uh, uh, hypotonic uh, solution and that means to equate the concentration the water will flow uh, from outside into the cell so the all the three uh, you know uh, light blue arrows they indicate that in this case where solute molecules are more uh, inside the cell the water outside the cell will try to enter into it to to equate or to balance the uh, osmotic pressure and uh, similarly if the concentration of these solute molecules is more outside the cell or extracellular uh, fluid then the the water from within the cell will try to come out and try to neutralize that uh, excess concentration and uh, uh, that uh, indicates a uh, hypertonic solution or osmotic flow is there of the water from within the cell to outside the cell and in case of you know uh, uh, we can uh, see a, a very good representative picture i have uh, uh, you know i was able to uh, that where uh, you know the hypertonic there is shrinkage of rbcs isotonic no shrinkage and uh, the 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 uh, uh, hypotonic swelling of the uh, rbcs will be there and they may ultimately uh, there may be hemolysis also 
So then uh, regarding tonicity of crystalloid solutions, hypertonic solutions, normally they are more than uh, 312 uh, milli uh, osmolarity per liter and 10% uh, DNS uh, dextrose normal saline or uh, the fluids like interlite 20% uh, they, they, uh, which contains 0.6% of NaCl, KCl, calcium chloride, uh, calcium lactate. Uh, they are uh, known as isotonic because their osmolarity is more than 312 uh, milli uh, um, osmo, osmol per liter. Now, in case of uh, hypotonic, it is less than uh, 300 uh, milli os os per liter, uh, like uh, lactated drinker solution, a, a very you know uh, light, mild hypotonic solution which we are uh, very frequently using. Uh, Five percent dextrose is also a moderately hypotonic uh, solution. Uh, they are uh, nearing three hundred, but less than three hundred, and the the. Uh, Isotonic between 300 to 312 uh, MOSM per liter, Ringer's uh, lactate solution 0.9% of normal saline, which we call 1.3% sodium bicarbonate solution. These are the solutions which are isotonic. Some are hypotonic and some are uh, hypertonic solutions. Now we'll see how, how to uh, use this, uh, uh, but before, you know, uh, using the most common condition in which fluid therapy is being used, uh, it is the dehydration. And uh, we, we uh, need to know uh, uh, what is the degree of dehydration. So for a clinician, uh, I think many of the, instead of going to the lab, we should be able to diagnose uh, uh, degree of dehydration or approximate the degree of dehydration. Uh, in a clinical case itself by standing by the side of the uh, animal. One very important is capillary refill time. Uh, it is known as CRT also. No, uh, uh, even if we you know, uh, press our uh, uh, finger and then release it, uh, we see that it becomes white and then slowly and slowly capillaries they refill and again it becomes uh, pink or red. So that is the capillary refill time. In animals, it is difficult to find out such a surface where we can read. But you know, uh, tongue is one, one vulvar lips where, where you can have the pinkish uh, uh, colorless skin or the, the mucous membrane. All those areas, they can be uh, chosen uh, for uh, determining capillary refill time. Then blood pressure is another because in case of dehydration, uh, all in blood pressure is there because the blood becomes uh, thicker and difficult to be pumped. So, uh, and then temperature. Usually we find subnormal temperature in case of uh, dehydration. It is difficult because the blood flow is not proper and that's why the body is unable to keep warmth throughout the uh, surface of the body. Then oxygen saturation, this I have specifically included because of the fact that now we know how to uh, use pulse oximeter. So even in case of animal, you catch hold of any, any uh, soft uh, surface and you fix uh, uh, pulse oximeter, you will find maybe tongue, maybe vulvar lips, or even uh, it may be a, 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 a shaved skin fold also. And then pulse. Now pulse, uh, I have not added rate because it is not the rate only. Pulse rate uh, is one of the indicators, but the quality of pulse will also help us in deciding the degree of uh, dehydration. What is the quality of whether it is weak or uh, feeble, uh, you know, uh, pulse uh, can be defined in many ways uh, when we pul palpate. And then uh, last is the uh, respiratory rate. So these are some of the vital signs which we should observe uh, before deciding the degree of uh, dehydration. Now, if we uh, no, actually uh, uh, come uh, to the uh, clinical aspect, uh, 
then the the degree of dehydration is uh, decided in terms of percent dehydration and this percent dehydration why it is uh, decided in the terms of percent dehydration because it helps us in deciding how much volume is to be uh, administered uh, as a fluid therapy so the the mildest form is less than 5% uh, you know uh, the, there is history of blood loss or you know uh, 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 non intake of uh, fluid uh, history of fluid loss uh, maybe through diarrhea maybe through vomition but on physical examination we don't find uh, any uh, sign which we have discussed earlier um, so we called it a, a dehydration less than 5% then 5% means dry oral mucous membranes, but there is no change in respiratory uh, you know, uh, rate or uh, there is no uh, pathological tachycardia. If it is more than 5, less than uh, 10, uh, around 7% dehydration, mild to moderate, decreased skin turgor. Now, this skin turgor is also uh, a very important clinical sign. Uh, which we should you know uh, incorporate into our examination to decide because it helps almost in all species of animal you know if you if you catch hold of you know the skin uh, uh, like this on uh, on the top of your uh, you know uh, hand and leave it now this skin will uh, will uh, you know uh, automatically settle but if it remains uh, uh, tented for some time then this time is noted and it is uh, an, a great indicator of you know, loss of skin turgor, which is uh, usually seen in case of dehydration and it, uh, uh, it is directly proportionate to degree of dehydration. Then dry oral mucous membrane, slight tachycardia, normal pulse corrector. That's why initially in the first slide, uh, a previous slide I have uh, mentioned that in the, in the uh, case of pulse, we do not consider on uh, uh, we, we do not consider only the rate, but the character of the pulse or the type of the pulse. Then 10% moderate to marked degree of decreased skin turgor, dry oral mucous membrane, tachycardia, normal pulse pressure, eye sunken in orbit. Now this is again uh, sunken eyes is again a very good indicator of dehydration for a veterinary. Uh, practitioner because uh, this this is directly proportional particularly in case of uh, even in case of pet animals dogs and cats as well as in case of uh, livestock also in large animals also sunken eye is a very good indicator of you know uh, uh, dehydration and then more than 10 percent these are alarming marred loss of skin turgor dry oral mucous membranes eyes sunken shock uh, animal tries to go into the uh, shock, then uh, rapid uh, losses result in rapid perfusion deficit in shock uh, and shock, which is always accompanied by an underlying illness. Uh, this is uh, compared to a slowly developing dehydration such as that occurring with uh, inadvertent hibernation of cat locked in a garage. This was one example given by a book uh, that if you if accidentally a cat is locked in a garage for uh, some days it doesn't have any access to water so it goes into a uh, degree of dehydration and then 12 to 15 percent it's a serious uh, dehydration and i think uh, beyond 15 percent it's very difficult to continue uh, the life so that's why this is the highest degree of dehydration which has been uh, you know uh, mentioned in the books uh, in which the, we find marked loss of skin turgor dry oral mucous membrane, eyes sunken, weakness, depressed. Again, uh, presentation will depend on rapidity of fluid loss. So these are, you know, some of the signs of physical examinations, uh, which uh, through which we can decide the uh, degree of uh, dehydration and, uh, you know, uh, arrive at a, a percentage of dehydration. And as a, as a clinician, I would advise that, you know, uh, we should focus on mild dehydration, uh, dehydration and severe dehydration. So if it is 5% or less, 
it is mild dehydration. If it is uh, a marked dehydration, then it is 10%. And if the animal is going into shock or has already gone into shock due to dehydration, it's a very severe uh, dehydration. So, so instead of these, you know, uh, six uh, categories, if we focus on uh, three kinds of categories, uh, then also we will be able to uh, administer the fluid therapy uh, accordingly. So now the question comes that how, how to calculate the uh, dose rates. Now the crystalloid fluids, uh, you know, just like uh, uh, NSS, normal saline solution, uh, resuscitation should be administered at the rates of, now it is the rate of administration. It should always be less than 20 ml per kg per hour. Now, this is a thumb rate, uh, which is applicable right from dogs to, to large animals, any animal. Usually, it is followed in human beings also, that the rate of administration should never be more than 20 ml per kg per hour. So, this, this, this figure, uh, we should uh, always keep in mind that our rate of administration doesn't exceed, uh, exceed uh, this uh, figure. Then total fluid requirement calculation uh, to correct dehydration. Then again, we, we need to uh, look into the table, previous table, the percent dehydration. Suppose if we, we fix 10%, then 10% dehydration means 10 uh, uh, over 100. That means that will become 0.1 into body weight. So, so that will be the uh, requirement of fluid in uh, 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 liters. And then the maintenance fluid requirement. Now, as we have seen in the uh, uh, previous slide, that the lowest uh, figure which we are considering very mild dehydration without any clinical sign, uh, only history of fluid loss, it is less than 5%. So that means we should consider maintenance fluid requirement uh, less than 5%. That's why it is 0.3. Uh, sorry, could have been our no. So, uh, so maintenance fluid requirement in uh, litter, it is, you know, uh, hmm. it is uh, calculated on the basis of 5% dehydration or less than 5% uh, dehydration. That's why we are taking the figure of, uh, you know, uh, 0.03 uh, or uh, 0.05 into body weight. Uh, I am giving a modest example of a dog to easily understand. We can extrapolate the same uh, thing uh, into uh, you know uh, uh, large animals also. So a 10 kg dog will require 0 0.5 maximum into 10 because it is 10 kg. So therefore, uh, 0.5 liter or 500 ml maintenance fluid per day with normal physical activities. Now, this is again a, a, a you know, uh, requirement because of the fact that uh, this maintenance fluid requirement is uh, you know, uh, uh, considered uh, on the basis of the normal fluid losses, which are there through you know, respiratory rate, respiration, evaporation from the body surfaces, perspiration, urination, uh, uh, during defecation also some fluid is lost. So if all the physical activities are normal, then you know uh, the, the requirement of fluid uh, will be uh, somewhere around uh, uh, 2.5 to 3% uh, of the uh, um, of dehydration degree what we uh, have seen earlier. So coming back to the crystalloid solutions, uh, what we, we uh, um, have considered earlier, the 
solutions which are having soluble molecules like uh, sodium chloride so uh, this is half uh, nacl the first uh, 0.45% nacl uh, so it is used in cardiac and liver diseases ascites edema etc uh, lactated ringers solutions or ringers lactate and normosol uh, the the normal isotonic solution first choice to use for dehydration maintenance and great for shock and acidosis uh, 0.9% uh, saline that is uh, nss then this is 0.45% uh, uh, saline with 2% dextrose so uh, this is half saline plus 2% uh, dextrose then the dextrose uh, 5% so so when we suspect hypernatremia we avoid uh, you know nss solution and wherever we require uh, you know the the energy to be uh, given intravenously then also uh, we uh, prefer uh, the dextrose solutions so this these are some of the examples of uh, you know, uh, crystalloid solutions now uh, just a, a, a list it's not a complete list but uh, parental uh, crystalloid fluids normally what are there they start from sodium chloride 0.2% 0.45 uh, and then the normal saline 0.9%, uh, sodium chloride high concentration 3%, 5%. Then comes the dextrose, dextrose 5% is the normal solution and higher solutions we, we are required to you know uh, give when we want to give instant energy or uh, for uh, some of the metabolic diseases we uh, prefer high concentration dextrose solutions and then uh, comes the dextrose plus sodium chloride uh, solutions d5 uh, and 0.9% uh, sodium chloride or what we call d5 ns normal saline or dns normally dns is being used for 5% dextrose and a normal saline solution and then comes the ringer selected uh, which we are very frequently use, using. So in nutshell, uh, the four types of fluids we are normally using during fluid therapy, NSS, the, the dextrose 5% or D5, what we call uh, DNS, dextrose normal saline and ringer selected. Now, uh, coming to... Uh, Again, the, the, the type of solutions and, and there uh, which are uh, isotonic, hypotonic or hypertonic. So this is again, I have uh, tried to you know, uh, make it clear that uh, the normal saline, ringer selectate or 5% dextrose in water, it is basically uh, isotonic solution. But as we know that you know, dextrose is utilized very quickly or glucose is utilized very quickly in the body. So initially it is isotonic, but later on changes into oh, hypotonic when dextrose is metabolized. And then, uh, you know, uh, NSS, usually fluid resuscitation for hemorrhages, severe vomiting, diarrhea, um, you know, uh, uh, wound drainage, mild hyponatremia or blood transfusions, we uh, use, uh, you know, uh, uh, normal saline solutions. Uh, ringer selected, Fluid, fluid resuscitation, GI tract fluid losses, burns, traumas, metabolic acidosis, often used during surgery also to, to you know, uh, uh, supplement fluid loss during the surgery. And similar is the case with 5% dextrose in water. It provides free water to help renal excretion of solutes, uh, hypernatremia, so that the, the, the sodium ion, which is in excess in the body, it gets excreted through uh, urine some dextrose supplementation which we require and use to dilute plasma electrolyte concentrations also then half uh, ns uh, or half saline solution what we call 0.45% sodium chloride it is used to treat intracellular dehydration and hypernatremia and to provide fluid for renal excretion of solutes so whenever uh, we, one thing we should keep in mind that whenever we administer hypotonic solutions, uh, they they will uh, you know trigger or they will stimulate renal excretion of fluid. 
so so that's why we are using 5% dextrose also uh, including it into the the hypotonic solution because of the fact that in the in the first uh, isotonic class we have already said that uh, when dextrose starts getting metabolized the water remains there and it becomes hypotonic uh, go on becoming hypotonic progressively uh, then uh, 3% sodium uh, chloride this is used to you know uh, uh, treat only hyponatremia and cerebral edema is usually associated if cerebral edema is associated with hyponatremia then then only uh, you know we should use 3% sodium chloride otherwise uh, uh, it is not used usually then 5% dextrose uh, and uh, half uh, sodium uh, chloride or half ns used to treat severe hyponatremia and uh, uh, cerebral edema then 5% dextrose and lactated uh, ringers uh, 5% uh, 5 uh, d5lr uh, i am afraid that this solution uh, uh, is not available now uh, in the market freely and it is used to treat uh, severe hyponatremia and cerebral edema and then d10 or or maybe uh, the more uh, um, concentrated dextrose solutions up to d50 uh, they are uh, hypertonic solutions now uh, you know what happens when we administer normal saline normal saline is one one of the very uh, ideal fluid, fluid therapy which we are using and we are giving it into the the plasma so when we give 1 liter of normal saline uh, only 250 ml is retained in the plasma and rest is sent to extra vascular interstitial fluid very rapidly very rapidly so that's how, that's how uh, you know uh, uh, we are uh, uh, treating because 75% of the fluid which we are giving intravascularly that will go into the extracellular interstitial uh, fluid out of the uh, blood vessels through oh, you know uh, mm, endothelial uh, leakage or or, or the uh, gates of uh, endothelium uh, in capillary network now estimating fluid volumes for replacement therapy now fluid therapy is divided into three phases uh, we uh, can see uh, emergency phase rehydration phase and maintenance phase and earlier i have described only two phases emergency phase uh, because uh, for the complete day we are observing uh, the animal and emergency phase and rehydration phase are usually clubbed in uh, practical practice and then comes the maintenance phase which can go uh, for two to four days now, uh, not all the patients require three-phase therapy. And to calculate the volume of fluid required to correct dehydration in liters, uh, we need to multiply the percent dehydration assessed by the patient's weight in uh, kilograms. Now, again, uh, for example, a 10% loss, 10% uh, uh, dehydration is there. So 10% dehydrated 10 kg dog will require uh, 0.1 into uh, 10 uh, is equal to 1 liter of uh, fluid um, uh, as, a, as an uh, emergency therapy or fluid replacement therapy. So this is how we, we calculate uh, with the percent dehydration. So that's why it is very, very essential that first we decide whether the animal is around 5% dehydrated category or 10% dehydrated category or more. So more is very serious cases. And usually the cases which we are brought, uh, which are brought to our uh, you know, uh, clinic or outdoors, they're around 5%. And some serious, uh, severe dehydrated cases, particularly in dogs, pet dogs, uh, they are around 10%. So this is how, uh, you know, let's say uh, we have to make a clinical judgment and uh, you know, uh, you'll see in the uh, later slides also that uh, a continuous monitoring is also essential. And even the the uh, texts they have uh, given that the animal should be examined uh, continuously examined. 
uh, you know, after every 10, 15 minutes, uh, said that uh, how much uh, uh, rehydration has been achieved so that we can monitor the uh, rate of uh, fluid administration. So uh, coming back to the emergency phase, when the patient is hypotensive and has clinical signs of shock, vascular volume uh, should be restored. Otherwise, the, the, the shock will precipitate you know, uh, immediately. So the goal of this phase is to reverse the hypotension and shock, not to correct dehydration. Because the first, first goal is that the patient should not enter into shock or should come out of shock. So then uh, the first thing is uh, to obtain IV access. Why I have specifically mentioned here uh, uh, obtain IV access because uh, in such cases where uh, you know uh, patient is already hypotensive, it's uh, sometimes there is uh, it is very difficult to to uh, uh, to obtain IV access. Uh, we have uh, not only to shave the area and find out a a, a bulging uh, vein. Uh, but also we may be required to, to give a cut to the skin and uh, uh, gain access to the uh, vein. Uh, and then IV fluid therapy should be administered according to history, physical examination and laboratory data uh, we have discussed earlier. And uh, uh, the, the most common, uh, uh, I am not discussing here the blood transfusion or uh, the plasma transfusion because uh, that is a uh, separate, uh, you know, uh, uh, field of transfusion therapy. But then the safest way is to use balanced electrolyte solution and balanced electrolyte solutions. The best solution is ringer selected. And if uh, the animal is alkalinemic, uh, we should use 0.9% uh, sodium chloride. Or if energy supplementation is required, we can use uh, DNS or dextrose 5% normal saline solution. Now, earlier we have uh, you know, uh, dealt with colloid osmotic pressure. Now, here, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, colloids, uh, again, uh, what are the types of colloids which we uh, you know, can administer? Uh, Hexastarch like dextran 70 or dextran. 46% uh, or 10% solutions, plasma, then, uh, you know, hemoglobin based oxygen carrying uh, solutions, whole blood is one of the uh, uh, considered as one of the colloids also, and intravenous uh, nutrition also, total parental nutrition, uh, which contains uh, protein molecules, uh, protein solutions also. So, so the hexastarch, they are usually uh, administered in case of hypovolemic shock uh, to increase uh, you know osmotic pressure where uh, there is a uh, subcutaneous edema throughout the body or uh, general anasarca or maybe SITs also so so uh, it helps in drawing fluid from interstitial spaces into the uh, vascular system and then the plasma hemoglobin base, they have uh, their different, you know, uh, uh, um, indications. But then uh, dextran 70, uh, it's a uh, uh, relatively uh, cheaper uh, uh, and easy choice available as a colloid for adjunctive treatment of hypovolemic shock uh, when, when the blood is not available. And then manitol, 10% or 20%, uh, it is to be given at 0.5 to 2 gram per kg body weight. Uh, it is used to promote diuresis and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, reduce the, the intracerebral pressures. This is very common therapy in case of, you know, uh, 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 where, where uh, the, the uh, traumatic shock to, to brain stem is uh, there and uh, the physicians in case of human beings, they are uh, suspecting some congestion and some uh, edema or maybe some hemorrhage also. So immediately after, uh, you know, avoiding shock uh, to the uh, trauma cases, they start uh, manitol therapy so that uh, the brain uh, congestion or brain edema is uh, reduced. So the same principle applies here uh, also in case of uh, veterinary practice.
Now, in case of uh, hypovolemic shock, uh, the example of uh, fluid replacement, uh, no, the the intravascular uh, volume loss should be taken as thirty percent uh, of uh, total volume loss of the blood, and here the 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 blood uh, volume comes. So it, the weight of blood volume. Uh, is uh, considered as 8% of the total body weight. That is the weight. Uh, so, so uh, as we have seen in the uh, earlier table, uh, that 5.5 uh, you know, uh, to 8.6% to is the uh, blood volume. So if we take, we consider uh, on an average 8% uh, uh, of blood volumes weight. So that is how we calculate that uh, in one kg dog, it is one kg, we can multiply it by, by the actual uh, weight of the dog. Uh, considering uh, the intravascular volume loss, because it is hypovolemic shock. So at least when, when uh, until uh, one third of the total volume is lost, the, the patient doesn't, uh, the animal doesn't go into a hypovolemic shock. So we consider it uh, 30% and one kg dog, so 0.3, into the total volume of the uh, blood into the body weight of you know uh, dog so it comes around uh, 24 liter uh, point, point, uh, 0.024 liter or say 24 ml or say 25 ml uh, per kg body weight because uh, we have taken the dog's weight as 1 kg so this is a simple formula that if we we are replacing the, the fluid, uh, particularly with colloid, then, then we should take uh, uh, 25 ml per uh, kg uh, body weight. Uh, at this rate, we should replace in case of hypovolemic shock. But if we, we choose, you know, uh, uh, crystalloid solution, then the crystalloid solution is recommended three times the, the, the uh, uh, volume replacement which is required. So therefore, you know, uh, the crystalloid solution, say for example, ringer selected or even N, uh, NSS, if we want to administer to correct hypovolemic shock, uh, we must administer at the rate of 75 ml uh, per kg, which may be an estimated requirement in case of hypovolemic shock uh, in animals. Now, uh, let us see uh, some of the important diseases of uh, livestock, like, you know, uh, uh, cattle, horses, sheep, goat, pigs, etc. So some of the, uh, these diseases, they, they require uh, also, uh, till now we have discussed hypovolemic shock and dehydration and all other things. But then there are very specific conditions uh, which, which uh, you know, uh, are generated in case of ruminants particularly and in case of horses also, uh, uh, which lead to dehydration. Uh, the the uh, uh, lack of fluid intake, if it is there due to deprivation, uh, they, they, there is no access to water uh, or lack of thirst, uh, which is there in case of toxemia or many other, uh, you know, even oral injuries also esophageal obstruction, then excessive fluid in case of, you know, uh, diarrhea, uh, uh, vomiting, fluid loss, excessive fluid loss, extensive skin wounds, uh, copious uh, uh, sweating in case of horses, acute carbohydrate engorgement in ruminants. This is a very common, uh, you know, uh, condition, clinical condition which, is, which we are coming across, carbohydrate engorgement. Acute uh, intestinal or uh, gastric obstructions, dilatation, volvulus of abdomen, etc. So one is uh, uh, on one side it is lack of fluid intake, another is excessive fluid loss. So both of them uh, will 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 lead to some of the conditions. Uh, if we start from the left side, the catabolism of fat, protein, and carbohydrate to produce water. And that will lead to acidemia and moderate, uh, moderate elevation of blood urea nitrogen. So that means if we, uh, we uh, 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 test for BUN or blood urea nitrogen, this, this again becomes a uh, good test for us. Uh, 
to detect the the pathogenesis of uh, dehydration then anhydremia uh, increase in uh, blood viscosity uh, oligemia hemo concentration and uh, it will lead to circulatory failure then there will be depression of uh, tissue fluid levels that will uh, lead to interference in tissue metabolism muscular weakness hypothermia and anorexia these will be the 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 clinical findings in this case and uh, there is compensatory reduction in fluid output that is uh, dry feces uh, decreased urine flow decreased sweating uh, there may be renal ischemia oliguria and concentrated urine and uh, exacerbation of acidemia so this is how the the dehydration uh, etiology starts and that is how the 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 pathogenesis is there and uh, that is how the the clinical signs uh, we are uh, observing in case of livestock particularly uh, i have tried to classify it and uh, if we see uh, some of the disturbances of body water electrolyte and acid base uh, in some common diseases of uh, uh, farm animals particularly and and uh, suggested of fluid therapy so uh, neonatal diarrhea this is one of the very common uh, case in almost all species of livestock and our fluid uh, or electrolyte requirements will be uh, equal nss plus isotonic sodium bicarbonate or uh, 5% dextrose plus rl and oral liquids uh, of course whenever you know one important principle here uh, i would would like to underline that you know if if animal is uh, able to take orally there is no uh, no fluid therapy cannot uh, you know replace the the oral rehydration so oral rehydration is always very important and whenever uh, there is uh, you know even even in human beings also uh, during all media advertisements uh, must have uh, we must have heard that uh, you know uh, you keep your water intake uh, perfect keep on drinking uh, fluids milk chas uh, lassi and uh, you know uh, water so so that is the uh, that is why the oral rehydration is is the best and the cheapest mode of you know uh, correcting dehydration then another very important i will uh, take it uh, in the next slide separately also carbohydrate engorgement in ruminants because in sheep uh, in goats particularly and in uh, cattle also uh, this carbohydrate engorgement is very commonly brought to our uh, uh, clinics particularly uh, veterinary colleges so the therapy is sodium bicarbonate and uh, balanced electrolytes because of the fact that uh, there is uh, metabolic acidosis severe dehydration metabolic acidosis why there is severe dehydration in such case we we all know it you know uh, when carbohydrate engorgement is there uh, rumen rumen starts you know sucking water from throughout the body into the rumen to 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 uh, you know uh, uh, correct carbohydrate uh, engorgement or to make it more fluidy so that that's why dehydration occurs and as the metabolism or lactic acidosis occurs there is acidemia so therefore we we need to fight on two fronts one correct the acidemia and another supply of the balanced electrolytes and ringer selected is the best solution in such cases acute diffuse peritonitis or paralytic ileus uh, dehydration plus alkalosis is there so again balanced electrolyte solution again uh, ringer selected is the best choice here then right side dilatation or abomasal uh, volvulus of cattle abomasal infection uh, vagal nerve injury it again leads to metabolic acidosis and therefore again our choice is uh, the balanced electrolyte solution uh, it is very difficult uh, to 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 administer high potassium and chloride uh, as uh, acidifying solutions because of the fact that in such cases we should have a uh, you no know, ready laboratory by the side of uh, our clinic uh, where we can uh, you know uh, very quickly Uh, even on uh, maybe after every few hours we are able to estimate the sodium potassium and chloride levels 
so unless we have uh, we should uh, we need to avoid uh, you know uh, the the potassium uh, therapy uh, then uh, per acute coliform mastitis this is one one you know out of the uh, uh, box disease which 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 leads to severe dehydration uh, mild electrolyte deficits including mild hypocalcemia metabolic acidosis uh, if concurrent diarrhea is there so this is one disease otherwise usually in mastitis uh, you know uh, we we uh, uh, do not uh, you know uh, uh, think that uh, uh, mastitis will uh, will be able to cause uh, the uh, the the uh, fluid uh, disturbances throughout the body but this is per acute coliform mastitis is one type of mastitis where uh, you know severe dehydration uh, Uh, occurs as well as mild electrolyte imbalance is also there. Again, the Ringer's lactate or BES is the 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 uh, uh, um, choice of therapy here. So, uh, considering some more diseases, acute diarrhea in horses, enteric salmonellosis. Again, uh, you know um, uh, there is severe dehydration. Uh, marred hyponatremia because uh, in uh, um, diarrhea there is uh, acute sodium loss metabolic acidosis so so uh, hypertonic solutions of uh, sodium bicarbonate to correct uh, metabolic acidosis uh, will be required acute grain engorgement in horses this is equivalent to you know uh, carbohydrate engorgement in case of ruminants Uh, it again uh, leads to metabolic acidosis, dehydration, and uh, shock. Uh, so here also we will require hypertonic sodium by uh, carbonate followed by balanced electrolyte solutions like Ringer's lactate. Water and electrolyte deprivation is a physical obstruction in horses. So the, it leads to moderate dehydration and balanced electrolyte solutions uh, will uh, you know uh, be a key for fluid replacement therapy. then acute intestinal obstructions uh, it again leads to uh, metabolic uh, disturbance there may be acidosis or alkalosis uh, depending upon the level of obstruction and it is uh, severe dehydration it leads to severe dehydration in horses moderate in case of uh, cows so isotonic sodium bicarbonate followed by balanced electrolyte intravenously so you know if we review all fluid and electrolyte requirements in case of uh, you know uh, uh, livestock uh, uh, cattle horses sheep goat and pigs the the key ingredient is uh, the balanced electrolyte or ringer's lactate and and i think we will come uh, you know uh, to the conclusion also that the best choice of uh, the fluid therapy should be the uh, balanced electrolyte solution or ringer selected because this is a, a, a sort of a, a therapy which will cover so many diseases so even if you are unable to point out a particular disease you will be able to you know hit, hit the the corrective uh, point uh, during now no uh, some of the diseases i have tried to list where uh, there is uh, iv fluid therapy Uh, in livestock some uh, aggressive requirement some of the diseases some of them uh, we have dealt uh, again i have tried to you know uh, uh, alpha in a alphabetical order uh, and list them uh, cecum disease carbohydrate engorgement coliform mastitis enteritis equine colic uh, interstitial obstruction intestinal obstruction uh, newborn diarrhea peritonitis uh, right side displacement of abomasum vagus indigestion urinary tract diseases endotoxemia anophasia cold injury hyperthermia shock hypovolemia or maldistribution of volume uh, type of shocks so these are uh, some of the you know uh, uh, diseases of livestock where uh, we require aggressive uh, iv fluid therapy so uh, common example in ruminants systemic acidosis and dehydration as it occurs in carbohydrate engorgement as i have uh, uh, mentioned earlier that most common cases are there in case of goats and uh, even cattle so it's better that they are treated with 5% sodium bicarbonate uh, iv 
uh, five liter for uh, you know four fifty kg animal given in first thirty minutes. So this is a uh, you know uh, aggressive uh, sort of treatment uh, in a very short period or shortest possible period. Uh, we should give uh, uh, the sodium bicarbonate solution so that we can neutralize the uh, the uh, uh, acidemia as soon as possible and even uh, you know uh, although it was out of purview but i am mentioning that we are trying to neutralize uh, the acidity within the rumen itself uh, by administering uh, sodium bicarbonate intraruminally and then this will usually correct the systemic uh, acidosis and this is followed by isotonic sodium bicarbonate 1.3% at uh, 150 ml per kg body weight intravenously over next 6 to 12 hours. So why a very big window 6 to 12 hours is given because of the fact that we need to continuously monitor. Uh, we need uh, not to, you know, although uh, little excess of uh, isotonic sodium bicarbonate is not going to harm the animal. Uh, but then uh, we need to, you know, uh, almost neutralize the uh, acidemia. Uh, so therefore the, the window is very... Uh, large 6 to 12 hours now therefore <clears throat> monitoring of fluid therapy is very essential particularly this is uh, you know uh, what my experience goes that in case of large animals or in case of farm animals or in case of livestock uh, we are usually underdosing with the fluid therapy we are, we are really uh, miser to to, to decide the dose and use the correct dose. But in case of dogs and cats, uh, it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, very essential that the fluid therapy should be monitored. Now, how we can monitor? There are perfusion parameters like uh, heart rate, pulse quality, mucous membrane color, capillary refill time or CRT. Uh, so web versus core temperature, uh, you know, uh, temperature between the web of uh, toe and what is the core temperature, then mental demeanor, uh, how, how fast it is, you know, recovered. So these are the parameters uh, which indicate perfect perfusion. So we call them perfusion parameters. Then hydration parameters, moisture of mucous membrane, skin turgor, uh, retraction of the uh, globe means eye, uh, eyeball. So these are the parameters for hydration. And we have seen earlier also that uh, while deciding degree of dehydration, we need to uh, have these as, uh, you know, uh, measure these as a sign to decide the degree of dehydration. Then body weight in case of small animals or dogs, particular dogs and cats, pet animals. Uh, when correcting dehydration, increasing body weight would be increasing because uh, we, we we can measure the body weight increase in case in in the uh, you know in few hundred grams also then urine output the, our goal if if uh, renal functions are normal which are usually there in, with our animals <clears throat> because of the fact that you know uh, although acute renal failure is one of the sequelae of severe dehydration and hypovolemic shock but then usually, the more, more, most number of cases which, which are coming to our um, attention in our uh, clinic, veterinary uh, clinic, uh, the, the renal functions are usually okay. So therefore, uh, the, the easiest way is that uh, we should measure the uh, urine output, which should be at the rate from 0.5 to 2 ml per kg per hour. It should be one of the goals because normal urine output is one of the indicators of uh, rehydration. In arterial blood pressure, this we can feel uh, only because uh, usually we don't have the facilities to measure arterial uh, blood pressure. Then central venous uh, blood pressure, uh, this we can uh, you know uh, measure by inspection of the uh, veins. Uh, major veins, maybe jugular vein or uh, any other, uh, you know, uh, veins of forelimb or hind limb. So, uh, what is the the filling rate? Uh, the veins, whether they are flat or poor filling, is there when we attempt to raise the vein? 
uh, that indicate uh, hypovolemia and if it is perfectly normal then we 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 uh, think that the uh, our fluid therapy is has started yielding results so these are the, that is how we uh, should monitor the uh, uh, fluid therapy and then blood testing some of the you know uh, parameters like fat cell volume total protein or electrolyte sodium and uh, potassium if if facilities are available uh, this will help us in deciding whether the the uh, still fluid therapy is required or the dehydration or hypovolemia has been corrected or not uh, so with this uh, you know uh, there is a danger particularly in very small body weight animals you know, pet dogs and cats uh, overhydration so what are the signs of overhydration we should also understand <clears throat> one important sign is peripheral edema that is uh, spitting on pressure uh, we may examine it on feet legs axilla face etc at uh, any of the places where there is peripheral edema so that is one sign of overhydration one very important sign and and uh, usually the early sign and chemosis chemosis is the the uh, the uh, eyelid I, uh, the edema of eyelid and the congestion of eyelids, the mucous membrane. Then pulmonary edema uh, that can be you know checked uh, with the stethoscope very easily if there is dyspnea or crackles or coughing or or, or indication uh, uh, of sounds indicating presence of fluid in lungs. Uh, so that also we can uh, very easily. Then cerebral edema there may be some of the you know, uh, signs like seizures or, or uh, you know, nervous signs, uh, which are associated with cerebral edema. <coughs> then uh, coming to the, the uh, last part of, uh, you know, uh, my uh, talk conclusions. Now, fluid should be considered as drugs and fluid therapy as prescription. And various components will influence many ionic interactions and shifts in uh, uh, plasma. Now, selection of fluid type and volume is a major component of the therapeutic plan and should include careful assessment of tissue and intravascular losses. That means uh, the fluid loss uh, within the tissues and uh, intravascular uh, fluid loss or uh, fluid loss in the uh, cardiovascular system, acid base and electrolyte status, age and species of the animal, nature of illness or injury, acute or chronic history, hematocrit and serum albumin concentrations. In the previous slide, we have seen that they may help us in uh, deciding whether there is uh, hydration has been achieved or not, coagulation status and cardiorespiratory functions. So these are the, the parameters <clears throat> which will uh, uh, decide our uh, therapeutic plan. And therefore, we need to assess uh, carefully all these parameters and then decide our uh, therapeutic plan. So. You know, initially in the very first slide, uh, our questions were, what are the uh, principles, uh, why to give, what to give, and how much to give. So, so uh, you know, uh, uh, let us see the answers uh, which we have found uh, during the, this whole presentation. What are the principles? So, the blood volume is around 6 to 8% of body weight. That is, you know, uh, because uh, body volume we are not taking, we, we are considering that the body weight, the, the specific gravity of animals and human body is around one. It's little, in some, some cases it, it is little less, in some cases it is little more. So, so uh, we, we consider the body weight as the body volume itself. Then degree of dehydration or volume loss is decided with the help of, uh, we have seen capillary fill time, blood pressure, uh, temperature, oxygen saturation, pulse and respiratory rates. So they, by, by these signs, you know, we can decide the degree of uh, you know, dehydration. 
and if we suspect the adhesion, uh, presume initially as 10%. So, so that is the best thumb rule that we start our treatment with 10% of uh, dehydration, presuming the dehydration at the level of 10%, we decide the dose, start administering, keep on monitoring, and it is very easy to withdraw at any time uh, if we see that rehydration is there. Then why to give? So, so again, uh, you know, uh, the five possible abnormalities which we want to correct, we have seen earlier, uh, fluid volume deficit, plasma osmolar deficits, or the electrolyte, uh, specific electrolyte imbalances, acid-base imbalance, or oncotic pressure imbalance, the pressure exerted by protein molecules. Or if we want to use as a vehicle or a placebo. Now, this is the placebo word I have very specifically incorporated here. And this is, a, uh, you know, uh, out of my experience only, that many a times when, whenever we are attending a, a, a serious case or a case, uh, you know, uh, which requires more attention, then even it goes in human beings also. But whenever uh, a case, you know, even if a VIP case is uh, admitted, the first thing is to start drip. So, so the, for the private practitioners, it is a very good thing that you you start uh, a drip or a fluid therapy, and then you can adjust the rate. You can keep the rate at the rate of maintenance rate, and it may act as a vehicle for administering uh, some other intravenous drugs, and then it will act as a big placebo, big placebo. You know, uh, the villagers which used to come when I was, you know, uh, professor of uh, medicine. Uh, no sooner we started, uh, you know, intravenous, uh, the, the, all the ladies and gents coming uh, along with the cow, they would become very happy that, oh, doctors, they have started, you know, very seriously the treatment. So it's a very big placebo uh, also. And then what to give? Uh, most common choice of crystalloid fluids. The first choice, again, the balanced electrolyte solution, uh, lactated ringer solution or ringer selected, DNS number two, or uh, NSS. The, these are the first choice of fluids, uh, of crystalloid fluids. Then most, most common choice of crystal, uh, colloid fluids, uh, they are dextran 70 in case of hypovolemic shock and mannitol uh, 10 to 20%. Uh, at the rate of 0.5 to 2 gram per kg to promote diuresis and rapidly reduce edema, particularly the cerebral edema. So this this is our you know uh, a very small prescription, a concise prescription after you know uh, thorough discussing everything that what we should give because of the fact that once we we, we uh, think of fluid therapy, so many things, so many options they come in mind, and usually we are unable to focus on that which should be the rightest choice of uh, fluid. And then how much to give? So in case of dehydration, uh, balanced electrolyte solution should be administered at the rate less than, this is the rate of administration, less than 20 ml per kg per hour. Uh, in no case, the rate of any IV administration should be more than 20 ml per kg per hour. It's a pretty high rate, very high rate. In case of large animals, even given the the, the presently available uh, IV IV uh, tubing sets, you know, uh, we cannot achieve even the, the rate of uh, 10 ml uh, per kg per hour. So so uh, it's a very high rate. Then fluid requirement to correct dehydration, percent dehydration upon 100 into body weight in kg. So this will give you a, a figure in liters. Uh, you take any animal, this is the basic thumb rule. Uh, any, uh, for uh, almost all mammals, this stands true that you need to have percent dehydration. And in earlier slide, we have seen that uh, we should start presuming 10%. Uh, so once we presume 10%, you calculate total and start administering the body fluid. And then uh, when you see that the dehydration is, uh, uh, you know, corrected in the first phase or emergency phase, first four to six hours, eight hours, then remaining fluid can be kept for 
maintenance fluid later on for next two to four days. Maintenance fluid requirement, again the same formula which we have discussed earlier, 0 0.03 to 0 0.05 into body weight kg. So this will give you a uh, requirement in liter because uh, the maintenance fluid we are calculating on the basis of uh, dehydration less than 5%. So it is 0.3 or maximum 0.5 percent uh, or maximum point uh, maximum 5 percent dehydration 3 percent to 5 percent dehydration this is the maintenance fluid requirement uh, we, we usually calculate so uh, anywhere you multiply it by body weight and you will uh, come out with a figure of uh, uh, fluid requirement in liters then uh, another question was how much to give so in case of <clears throat> shock, uh, the crystalloid solution, uh, balanced electrolyte solution may be at the rate of 75 ml per kg, assuming 30% uh, intravenous volume loss. This is not dehydration. Uh, so again, I am underlining it that we should not confuse in case of hypovolemic shock, uh, the, 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 the volume loss of the cardiovascular system or vascular volume loss, uh, we should not confuse it with degree of dehydration because uh, you know no animal can survive on 30% of dehydration. 15% is the last limit which has been mentioned by almost all the books nationally as well as internationally. So we cannot uh, uh, presume that a, a body of a, of a mammal will survive more than 15% of uh, dehydration. But this is a intravascular volume loss, which will not uh, go parallel to the degree of dehydration of the whole body. So that's why uh, uh, the hypovolemic shock, we consider one third of volume has been lost. So therefore, we, we uh, uh, consider 30% uh, IV loss. So in case of crystalloid, uh, we require three times the total volume. So the volume earlier we calculated was 25 ml per kg. So we have multiplied by three uh, if we are administering uh, crystalloid uh, balanced electrolyte solution. And in case of dextran, etc., et uh, uh, the doses of uh, 10 to 20 ml per kg or continuous infusion of one to two ml per kg per hour with the total dose up to 25 ml per kg. So again, we are coming, if we are giving a uh, colloidal solution, uh, the maximum dose should be 25 ml per kg because the, the volume loss is 30%. And if we are uh, giving a crystalloid BES, then the dose should be three times higher, so 75 ml per kg uh, body weight. And blood and plasma transfusion, they are another you know alternative to correct the shock or hypovolemic shock, but since this comes under the transfusion therapy, so it's a separate chapter, I have not included it. Uh, so, uh, hope that uh, now we have a better understanding of the principles of uh, fluid therapy. Uh, with all these, uh, this uh, presentation, I have uh, tried to, you know, uh, simplify the, the whole uh, you know, very complicated and very big uh, um, chapter or very big you know, uh, um, uh, uh, topic of uh, fluid therapy in animals. So uh, uh, thank you all. Thank you very much. And uh, over to Dr. Santosh Sinde. For a question and session. I will invite my colleague, Dr. Naresh Kulkarni, to take a question and session. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll be sharing. Uh, I have compiled it in a presentation, so it will be easy. For sir and participants also to view the questions. Sir, the, what could be the best method to record the capillary refill time in case of cattle buffalo and sheep? Mm. Should I start answering from the first yes, question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, 
uh, say for example as i was telling that in case of uh, you know human being it is very easy if you if you uh, you know uh, uh, press like this leave it you will see that the the pale uh, uh, you know uh, skin area it, it becomes refilled with the uh, capillary refillment uh, and the restoration of the pink color is there but then uh, the question is very uh, correct that in cattle buffalo and sheep now we need to you know uh, uh, look for such mucous membranes which are there which we can uh, clinically uh, examine one is tongue tongue is also lips lips another inside of lip that is uh, uh, one uh, very good uh, indicator where we do not have a pigmented site we do not have a pigmented site and uh, where we do not have hairs so we need to another is the vulva so these these, these uh, two uh, things are uh, very good and in case of you know uh, uh, lactating cattle and buffalo even uh, the the portion of udder uh, the, that that may also give uh, in case of sheep and goat you know inside of thigh also uh, that uh, that presents us with a with a wherever there is a uh, you know uh, capillary refilling uh, skin available to us where we can see so we need to find out uh, there and that's why i said that you know uh, the the tarzer of skin uh, the you know uh, just tenting of skin and leaving it so this this is a uh, you know very good indicator and such type of skin folds can be obtained in case of uh, large animals also uh, and uh, the 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 area below the tail capillary refill time area below the tail so uh, uh, the the skin even the neck skin of large animals you can have uh, it even the cheek skin of uh, you know cattle buffalo Uh, we can uh, have uh, you know read uh, the skin tarzer thank you thank you sir can we use the ringers lactate for inflammatory conditions or not uh, just dr murina just wanted to know that for the colitis the colic cases can we use it uh, uh, actually uh, if i am not uh, you know confusing with the question you know uh, if we take uh, colic in horses or uh, colic in uh, you know uh, maybe uh, even small animals uh, pet dogs also ringers lactate is is the uh, choice of drug so the choice of drug you know uh, wherever we we do not require i think i i uh, um, could not show you uh, one slide where where uh, you know i will just try to um, Uh, see it whether uh, that is present uh, in my presentation or not. If it is there, I am. I will be just sharing the screen once uh, again. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. I think somehow uh, it must have uh, you know missed. Uh, why why ringers lactate is uh, preferred? Uh, I am just uh, you no. Know, Uh, is it visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So I'm uh, making it in uh, slideshow mode. I think this slide skipped. Uh, th this will give uh, a, a correct answer. You know, if we see the osmolarity of plasma, you know, uh, sodium one thirty five to one forty five. uh this is in uh, milli uh, osm per liter potassium 4 to 5 calcium 2.2 to 2.6 magnesium uh, chloride uh, or uh, um, uh, it is in the form of chloride we can say uh, chlorine uh, 95 to 110 now if we see this this concentration uh, of Uh, you know uh, important ingredients like bicarbonate lactates chloride magnesium calcium uh, potassium sodium and if we see the the composition in ringers lactate here i think you are able to see yes you know, sir this particularly ringers lactate has been 
formulated in such a manner that it will it should provide three ingredients in the same osmolarity, osmolarity as they are present in the plasma 135 to 145 130 sodium is there 4 uh, to 5 4.5 potassium is there uh, 2.2 to 2.6 2.7 calcium is there now magnesium usually we, we do not occur a frank hypomagnesemia cases so that's why it has been avoided in case of ringer's lactate uh, the the lactate is more lactate is more and the osmolarity is little less than the you know uh, plasma and that's why we are uh, i have classified uh, ringer's lactate as mild hypotonic solution but then it supplies all all other uh, ingredients so this 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 is a balanced electrolyte solution, which uh, I think that uh, you know uh, uh, we 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 should consider it as the the first choice. Yes, yes. You can yes, share sir. your question screen again. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sharing again. Uh, sir, what is the perioperative fluid of choice, and what should be the rate? Ah. Uh, you know, uh, in in uh, uh, I think the perioperative fluid uh, uh, means Dr. Manav must be uh, uh, looking for uh, uh, a fluid during surgery. Yes, fluid during surgery. So then, uh, you know, usually we are preferring uh, DNS at that time because of the fact that uh, we are uh, uh, operating a case which doesn't have any uh, presuming that this case doesn't have any electrolyte imbalance it doesn't have any acid uh, base imbalance the, the thing which this case will require will be energy in the form of glucose and will be a support to to compensate fluid loss during the surgery so that's why usually we prefer dns in the perioperative fluid of choice. Thank you, sir. And sir. then uh, the next is, what is the limitation of using DNS in febrile condition or hyperthermia? Uh, actually, uh, you know, uh, this is again, a, uh, Dr. Nabi, it is a debatable issue. Uh, even when I was student, I was taught that, you know, uh, we should not gluco give uh, dextrose uh, in case of febrile uh, uh, patient uh, because of the fact that uh, you know uh, uh, we were thinking that uh, once the uh, glucose or dextrose will be metabolized it will you know release some energy and the temperature may further rise but then subsequently as on today you know uh, the the, the uh, information is that during febrile condition you require to supplement energy also. So therefore, it is not, uh, you know, there is no harm. If it is not contraindicated in any of the texts now, it is not contraindicated. So, so uh, we uh, uh, cannot, the only thing is that, you know, uh, in very small animals uh, like pet dogs, we should be cautious about the rate of uh, you know, uh, uh, administration. If it is administered at, at a faster rate, uh, uh, you know, the shivering and uh, all other uh, complications may be there. So, uh, otherwise, there is no, uh, uh, technically speaking, or, uh, you know, with the scientific support uh, speaking, uh, DNS can be given in febrile condition. Uh, because of the fact that uh, dextrose uh, energy, but then uh, you know there is one another question which I will uh, like to put. You know, if in case of febrile condition or a hypothermia, hyperthermia, hyperthermia, if it is heat stroke, then you don't require glucose there because that uh, the the first thing is uh, the heat stroke uh, will cause electrolyte imbalance. So you need to give uh, balance electrolyte solution or ringer selected uh, as a, as a uh, first choice to correct. So in, in febrile condition, unless you require 
that the patient should be supplemented with intravenous energy then only you should give uh, dns otherwise usually there is no uh, you know requirement of dns in a uh, case of febrile unless it is suffering earlier from some other uh, you know uh, disease associated with prolonged anorexia where there is uh, you know uh, uh, lowered glucose levels thank you thank you very much sir can we use the ringer's lactate in case of the liver disease and the blood transfusion these dr amit these are two entirely different you know blood transfusion uh, is not a disease you know uh, if you are doing blood transfusion then uh, you don't require any other fluid at that time you don't require any other fluid and uh, there is per se no contradiction with uh, you know liver disease and ringer's lactate because ringer's lactate doesn't contain uh, any such substance which will be very difficult for the liver to metabolize there is no complicated molecules it's a simple electrolyte balanced electrolyte solution so therefore i don't find that you know uh, even in liver disease why ringer's lactate should not be given but in case of any uh, you know uh, liver disease uh, uh, the fluid requirement uh, liver disease will not require a fluid require uh, 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 fluid therapy any other associated disease will uh, or condition will require a fluid therapy and uh, the type of therapy will depend on that associated condition with the liver disease thank you thank you very much sir uh, so the next set of questions are there sir uh, for treating cerebral edema can we use this 5% dextrose uh, i think cerebral edema we use dextran and the best thing is uh, manitol for cerebral edema you know 5% dextrose what is what is the the uh, we uh, dr sazen we should understand uh, you know how uh, 5% dextrose will be dead uh, in the body if we inject intravenously you know the dextrose or the glucose part it will be metabolized very easily consumed very very quickly so even if you are administering 1 uh, liter in case of a say for example a, a, a uh, 10 15 kg dog i think within next one or two hours most of the dextrose is going to be utilized by the body so then there will remain only water and since it will remain isotonic for some time at least for an hour or so the the isotonicity will be maintained within the blood and during that time in the very uh, earlier slides i have shown that only 25% will be retained within the vessels rest will go to uh, um, uh, extra vascular fluid so so uh, within no time the excess water will enter into the uh, Uh, extra vascular spaces so so uh, that is that is why uh, i don't think that 5% dextrose in any case uh, will be helpful in reducing the edema in reducing the edema but one thing if you are trying to point out to that that you know these solutions they are always diuretic they are always diuretic and any diuretic will have some relieving effect on cerebral edema but it's not a direct treatment of cere cerebral edema we need to prefer the colloidal solutions like manitol 10% or so thank you thank you very much sir so what should be the fluid of choice for chronic kidney diseases in animal is it the ns or dns or ringer's lactate no i think that uh, to, to me it appears that you know if uh, chronic renal disease is there uh, in any of the um, you know uh, uh, animal uh, that animal may not require fluid therapy as such any other condition associated with chronic renal disease will require as as uh, as i have told in case of you know liver disease as such yes so so it the choice of fluid will depend upon 
the the uh, you know uh, which condition is there and usually there is there is no uh, you know uh, in chronic renal disease uh, you know uh, uh, this uh, uh, fluid overload is contraindicated we should not overload the body because the kidney functions are already compromised so 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 uh, so that is uh, the choice will depend otherwise per se uh, none of them ns dns or rl they are not contraindicated in uh, chronic renal disease uh, next is how can we differentiate dehydration and hypovolemia clinically and difference in uh, line of treatment uh, again dr sajan is there uh, the very uh, good uh, uh, you know uh, question is there uh, you know dehydration uh, as uh, uh, i have tried to explain it that you no know, there are always causes of dehydration available so so uh, that will indicate the dehydration and uh, hypovolemia is one condition which is Uh, 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 related to to uh, you know volume loss of blood blood volume loss and this blood volume loss may be on account of any uh, severe bleeding uh, 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 burns also it is uh, there in case of you know uh, uh, Certain other conditions where uh, extra vascular leakage is there, extensive extra vascular leakage. Either there has to be a frank, uh, you know, hemorrhage, or extra vascular, or a, a massive capillary hemorrhage, or a condition like extensive burn, where there is the 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 volume selectively. The body as such is not dehydrated. Let us make it different. The, uh, when we talk of hypovolemia. this is not the volume of the body this is volume of the vascular system so the the blood volume is reduced the blood volume is when blood volume is reduced then we need to correct hypovolemia because first preference is not to correction correct the dehydration we need not to bother because hypovolemia will lead to shock immediately within uh, hours time and unless it is corrected immediately the animal uh, will go into shock and ultimately may die so dehydration can be dehydration any degree of dehydration can be associated with the condition which has caused hypovolemia but then uh, uh, taking two things parallel our first choice of uh, you know uh, therapy will be or first uh, you know emergency will be to correct hypovolemia and then to look for uh, dehydration thank you thank you very much sir in case of hydroallantides how much quantity of fluid and which type of fluid is preferred <laughs> this is a uh, very uh, you know uh, specific uh, uh, condition uh, which uh, the, has been uh, you know asked by dr mishra and i am uh, you know uh, of the opinion uh, maybe i may be wrong that you know in case of Mm, hydroallantoids uh, you what what is our first priority uh, why why at all uh, we will require fluid that 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 is the another uh, thing uh, you know the uh, one one uh, you know uh, whenever uh, i i will uh, try to explain it in a very lighter way that every one of has uh, one of us has a, uh, has a preferred god so whenever there is any problem we we remember one one god you will you may remember uh, uh, some god i may remember some god so you know in case of fluid therapy balanced electrolyte solution is is is, is the thumb rule you give balanced electrolyte solution but in case of hydroallantoids i i don't uh, know that why uh, why the fluid therapy will at all be required 
but even if you require a fluid therapy uh, you close your eyes start bes that's all and thank you, thank you very much sir the last question in case of the poisoning is there any change is there any change to calculate the fluid therapy Dr. Vurupalli just wanted to ask in case of the injection of the poison or the bites. No, Dr. Vurupalli, uh, my answer to your question will be, you know, uh, uh, in most of the poisons, it has been recommended to flush the cardiovascular system through diuresis. So fluid therapy, even it has been uh, recommended in the text, in case of many poisons, but then the, the poison to poison will, uh, the fluid will differ, but you may use very easily hypotonic solutions, which will, uh, you know, uh, make diuresis and during diuresis, the poison will also be flushed out of the body. But in case of bites, you know, uh, you know uh, we need to decide uh, as per the type of bite. They say, for example, some of the bites, uh, they, they, they cause, uh, you know, uh, extensive um, uh, capillary damage or endothelial damage and hemorrhages are there, uh, you know, subcutaneous hemorrhages uh, um, uh, within the organs also. So there we need to neutralize the, the uh, poison. The first choice will be because of the fact that this doesn't demand any fluid replacement there there is no you know electrolyte imbalance so fluid therapy in case of poisons is only uh, you know advocated uh, uh, as uh, 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 in order to flush out the uh, poisons through through you know uh, urine primarily and maybe through feces also because unless you administer uh, ample amount of fluid or the body is in a well hydrated position the intestinal, uh, you know, peristaltic movements will not, uh, will also not be, you know, uh, there. But the choice will depend on if the poison is ingested and it has caused vomition. So vomition, you know, is one condition which will try to deplete potassium. This will try to deplete potassium. But the first thing is that due to uh, the effect of unless the vomition is very persistent for some days, one or two days, and and lot huge amount of vomitus is there, frequency is very high, uh, significant amount of potassium is not lost uh, due to uh, you know uh, some vomition caused by ingestion of the poison. So everything will depend on. Uh, otherwise, for bites etc. Usually, we don't require uh, fluid therapy. If you are talking with the uh, about the stings or bee sting or something like that, wasp sting or uh, if it is snake bite, then there is a uh, danger of you know uh, hemorrhages, widespread hemorrhages. So we should be uh, very particular in deciding uh, in not overloading the system. Otherwise, that will increase the uh, uh, leakage of fluid from uh, capillaries, which are which have already been damaged damaged by the uh, you know uh, effect of the poison thank you thank you very much sir thank you very much for your knowledge refreshing session sir over to dr santosh uh, thank you very much uh, dr naresh and thank you very much sir for making this question answer session also very interactive uh, sir the flag end of the session vote of thanks so warm and graceful evening to all the participate and honorable professor colonel dr a k gallo sir it is my privilege to propose vote of thanks as well as acknowledge the contribution of those who really worked very hard to make this webinar successful on behalf of lmb pharmaceutical and all the participants sir from lm myself dr santosh shinde express my sincere gratitude to honorable professor dr colonel a k gallo sir for such a informative and applied presentation on basic understanding of basic of fluid therapy in animals and sir i am very sure that this your presentation will definitely help all the uh, participating student veterinarian field veterinarian faculty for day to day practice sir 
in future also we will take the benefit of such session sir apart from that i will i will like to thank all the olympic field staff dgm sales and on our my entire team dr amit naresh sanjay and amit and dr thomre for making this webinar successful once again thank you honorable ak galos sir and all the participating veterinarian from india and abroad sir on with the permission of uh, speaker i conclude today's session is over mm -hmm. thank you so much thank, thank you very much everybody thank you sir. thank you have a good day